Underwriters of the Arizona Mining Review include Mining Foundation of the Southwest, a nonprofit organization based in Tucson, Arizona, working to educate the public about mineral resources and the mineral extraction and processing industries. Amigos, Southwest Buyer's Guide. For almost 40 years, Amigos has worked to provide a better business environment for mining. Pioneer Equipment Incorporated, serving the equipment needs of the mining industry since 1959. And Copper State Bolt and Nut Company, in business since 1972 with 21 branches to serve you. Good morning and welcome to the November 25th episode of the Arizona Mining Review. I'm Mike Conway. Lee Allison is out of the office today, so I'll be handling the AMR duties this month. We're going to be joined by Niall Nemeth, as usual, for an overview of the mining developments in the state. Dan Ide of the St. Cloud Mining Company is going to come on and talk about zeolites and talk about acid mine drainage remediation. He's got some really interesting things to say about that. And we're going to be in the field. Uh, the latter part of the show, we're in the field with John Spencer and Niall Nemeth in the northern Plumosa Mountains of western Arizona. And we'll be talking, John and Niall will be talking about copper, gold, and manganese deposits out, out there. So Niall, let's get started as usual with you. Has, Arizona, has the Arizona mining community something to be thankful for for this Thanksgiving? Well, we've got a, a number of uh, positive items to report. So I think, I think that's some good news, something to be thankful for. But we might, we might just uh, start off by saying, though, that we do, unfortunately, see the uh, continuing weakness in the copper price. Yeah. We've seen another, uh, you know, 20 cent perhaps drop in the price since our last uh, discussion. That's dramatic. I'm sure it's going to impact the, uh, the Arizona copper community a little bit. Yeah. yeah, as this price continues to weaken, it wouldn't be surprising to see people having to rethink or, or add to those layoffs they had already announced. Right. So what is, you've got some good news, let's share it. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, we can start out with copper and some good news is that ASARCO and the EPA have reached an agreement on the Hayden smelter. And I guess the good news there is we're gonna see a significant investment that's gonna let the smelter become one of the cleanest in the world. They're anticipating investing over $128 million. Wow. That's gonna reduce the sulfur emissions, some of the fugitive dust emissions, uh, they're going to have to do some things that don't directly affect the smelter. So we're going to see some improvements to some of the roads as well as the mine, which is to the north at the Ray Mine, is okay. going to get a new diesel locomotive. And were they saying something about removing 97, 98 percent of the sulfur? I think it's even higher than that. Wow. And the Hayden smelter is Yeah, you're right. Oh. They plan, the efficiency will uh, re get the removal to 95 to 99 percent. That's fantastic. And that, that smelter has been in operation, correct me if I'm wrong, 100 years plus? Over 100 years. That's remarkable. Yes, yeah, so a large, large part of that is going to come from the converter retrofit. Okay. And they'll be working on that. What's the time frame for completing that work? And You know, it's taken years to get this uh, agreement put together. I don't know that they've uh, hired contractors or have, have okay. that length of the project determined yet. Okay. So it's going to be an ongoing process for some time. Yeah, good. but you know, but like I say, so it's good news for the environment, good news for the continuation of the operation. Yeah, absolutely. That's good for that community up there as well. So what else is what else have you got for us today? Um, you know, perhaps uh, Freeport uh, got an early Christmas present or, you know, it's got oh. something to be thankful for at Baghdad Mine. Uh, Mojave County, as we had discussed, uh, I think during the summer, had appealed the Department of Water Resources approving the water rights from the Lincoln and Planet Ranch being withdrawn up at the Big Sandy Valley up by Wikia. Okay. That water would ultimately be used for the Baghdad operation. And we've gotten word from the Arizona Supreme Court that's upheld that federal legislation from Representative Gosser related to that uh, complicated water deal. Oh, well, that is good news. Yeah. Yeah. And so the basic findings in this case were that Mojave County basically had no standing in those water rights, so they weren't really uh, a party to be considered. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they just strongly affirmed that uh, agreement. Excellent. And should we... we yeah. should, I, guess, I guess part of the thing was there's there's no water being transferred right. out of Mojave County, was, was a significant part. Yeah, yeah. That, that water, this, this bill doesn't move that, that water. 
right well, anywhere. Yeah. It's still, it's still, I shouldn't say it's not out of Mojave County, but those, those water rights haven't changed. Excellent. So anyway, they've got that resolved for, for the moment. That's right. Okay. Hey, I understand that, I know that work has started again on the Copperstone, uh, Copperstone Gold Mine. It's an underground mine at this point. Started out as a pit mine, I think. What's the news there? Yeah, you know, it's one we talked about briefly on the uh, the field trip, the Arizona Geologic Society field trip to Western right. Arizona. And the news there is that the new owner, Para Mines, has okay. uh, had a drilling program, and about I forget about a five thousand foot drilling program, and they were drilling some holes in the pit that were testing mineralization that had been previously identified uh -huh. that's in a peril zone below the main copperstone zone. Oh. And so they've reported some some narrow but some fairly high grade intercepts. And what this does, it may allow for some you know, future development of another level from the underground workings instead of just that single zone. Okay, and they're still in the planning phase at this point. Um, production phase someplace in the near future? You know, the, the new company hasn't really made any, any kind of uh, announcements, to my knowledge, okay. uh, to resume production. But the, certainly the, you know, the mill that was uh, operated by American Bonanza is still in right. place, so it wouldn't take a whole lot to resume production. Yeah, right. Very good. And I imagine all their permits are in place. They, they were operating a year and a half ago or so, or two years ago, so it probably isn't going to be difficult for them to get started again if they need to. Right. They just need to be nice to see them, you know, find some additional resources. They could have multiple areas of development. Yeah. And again, the, the grades they intercepted were pretty nice. Uh, okay. They've had grades reported as high as 13.8 uh, uh, grams per ton. That Number sounds very promising. Uh, multiple digit grams. Yeah. Like they still up over, uh, I don't know if these were true wits, they reported, uh, you know, only three to six foot intersections. Mm -hmm. But nice grades. Very good. And I know the Arizona Daily Sun carried a, uh, an article today, I think it was, about the canyon mine and the progress being made up there in, uh, I guess it's on the south rim of Grand Canyon. Yeah, I think that was just kind of an update to, to affirm that, as expected with the closure of the Pine Nut, the depletion of the resource of Pine Nut, right. they've moved their mining crews to the, to the canyon mine, which had had a head frame erected and a little bit of shaft sinking completed way in the past. Right. What they're doing now is they're going to complete that shaft down to about 1,200 feet so they can access the mineralization to be mined. Yeah. And that's uranium that they'll be uh, yeah, bringing out of the ground. Yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll mine and then truck up to their mill in Utah. Right. Do we have any time frame for when they're actually going to go into production? How long does it take to sink a shaft, a shaft uh, 1,200 feet? You know, I, I, I haven't checked at the company's website recently to see how far they've got that shaft sinking advanced. I know they're working on it, but I would expect that production will be next year. Okay, very good. Very good. Anything else? Yeah, there's one other uh, kind of positive development for energy fuels, and that is they recently acquired 100% interest in the weight breccia pipe, which is located uh, further to the west. Okay. They did that by... Uh, acquiring the 50% that they did not hold from Anfield Resources. And Anfield actually had fairly recently acquired that from Uranium One. So there's, so there's been a bit of a, a dealing related to the shooter ring mill okay. up in Utah on these properties. But that's a nice consolidation. There's about a million pounds identified from surface drilling at the weight. At the weight. And again, this is a breccia pipe? Yeah, Uranium okay. breccia pipe mineralization. Very good. Very good. And they're on federal lands or state lands out there? You know, that's that's an interesting point you bring up, Mike. One of the, the advantages or the features of that deposit is that it's held on state trust lands. Okay. And so it's not affected in any manner by the federal right. withdrawal that's affecting most of the, the plateaus. Yeah, that's a, and that's a 20-year withdrawal period, so that's a, a considerable period of time. Very good. Niall, is there anything else, or are we, we were getting ready to wrap up here? Yeah, you know, we can wrap up here. I'll just throw out one more uh, positive piece. You know, it's it's slow and prices are down. I know a lot yeah. of people are, uh, you know, holding off on their exploration plans. And this is actually uh, month-old news. But Red Hawk announced that at Copper Creek, Anglo-Americans completed their first year $3 million work commitment by doing some exploration drilling as well as some 
uh, geophysics. Mm -hmm. And I guess the good news is the geophysics has confirmed some known targets as well as identified some additional targets as a combination of uh, some ZTEM magnetics okay. and hyperspectral work on the Copper Creek District. And so they're going to uh, to continue to their, their program for another year and uh, let's hope they have some good luck. Absolutely. The okay. next round of drilling. Very good and we'll, we'll stay on top of that because that sounds like an interesting story. Niall, thanks so much for joining us and have a happy Thanksgiving. You too, Mike. Thank you. Okay. Hi, I'm Mike Conway. We're here today with Dan Ide, CTO and President of the St. Cloud Mining uh, Firm right here in Tucson, Arizona. And Dan's going to talk to us a little bit today about the role of Arizona zeolites can play in, in remediating acid mine drainage. Dan, welcome to the show, and tell us a little bit about yourself and about St. Cloud. Oh, thanks, Mike. Uh, I was inadvertently involved with zeolites since I was six years old. I came up from Mexico with my dad, who was a geologist for the uh, Union Carbide Company. Mm -hmm. uh, he was credited with discovering the buoy deposit in right. 1960. And my strongest memory is I saw the last steam engine go through buoy. Wow. And standing there watching the wheels spin and the of the thing taking off sure. as a young kid. So I can now say I've been involved with zeolites in Arizona for 54, 55 years. Okay. Um, I went to school to be a geologist and then promptly tried to do everything but. Mm -hmm. And uh, took a stint in the Marine Corps even to see if, if I wanted to do that and that was worse. So <laughs> I came, came back, back to, to school, sure. but I actually have a business degree rather than a, a okay. geology degree. I am, though, a registered geologist in the state of Arizona. I had to take all four parts of that darn exam. Right. Um, in industrial minerals like zeolites, m selling them and marketing them is far more important than the geology, which is often very simple. Mm -hmm. And St. Cloud Mining is all about zeolites? or St. Cloud's Mining is uh, all about zeolites. We're the largest producer of natural zeolites in the United States, probably uh, actually in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, this year, of all grades, we'll probably produce more than 50,000 tons. We're, we're having a good year. Okay. Uh, we have operations at the Winston uh, Mine in New Mexico. Okay. It's the old Winston Quarried Silver District. It was originally a silver mine. And our silver processing operation that was converted to a zeolite operation. We have the Bowie Chavazite here in Arizona. Uh, we have the Ash Meadows Clonatel Light in uh, Nevada, California, and we have a processing plant there. And then we have a deposit of Mordenite up in Rome, Oregon. Mm -hmm. uh, so we also have probably the most complete uh, variety of, of commercial natural zeolites in the United States. And you States. brought a couple samples with you? I brought some samples just to show you what what things look like. Uh, we did a project down in Patagonia. Okay. They bought the material. It's up and running. It's a passive remediation site. And we should probably tell people, uh, give people a sense of what the zeolites, what you're using the zeolites for, why you're producing them, and how they're being used. Sure. Uh, zeolites are are natural molecular sieves. Mm -hmm. That means they have these pores in them that are very evenly sized. Right. And different types of cations can come in and go out. And we naturally have usually sodium, calcium, and potassium cations sure. in. And then when you have things like copper, lead, zinc, silver, thallium, uranium, all these nasties, right. we can actually change those existing cations for something that it has a higher selectivity for. Okay. Um, in, in uh, two instances, our two probably most significant jobs, one occurred when I was a consultant for uh, Union Carbide. My dad and I had a company that was a consulting company. Mm -hmm. We operated the deposit form. It was Three Mile Island. That was kind of the start of my career. And now here at the end, we've sold a lot of the zeolites that went to right. a company that uh, was able to do the remediation there at uh, Fukushima in Japan. Sure. And uh, in that case, the cation of interest specifically was primarily cesium because sure. it's so strongly radioactive. Yeah, so these things are actually absorbing or taking into their structure whatever there might be, whatever metallic ion. It could be uh, uh, lead, copper, uh, iron. Iron Perhaps iron's probably not quite as important. It's not it usually as important. Uh, we've done a lot of test work. We're working hard on or diligently on treating different types of mine waste. Sure. 
The project down at Patagonia depends on the cation exchange properties. Okay. It depends on the buffering properties, where a, a good uh, alternate treatment to uh, uh, acid mine drainage sure. or acid rock drainage. And down there at Patagonia, it's a combination of both. There's mm -hmm. old uh, mining operations right. and just the uh, uh, granite intrusive there sure. creates enormous amounts of just acid ro right. acid drainage regardless. And we saw some effluent coming out of the Patagonia region probably about a year and a uh, year and some months ago maybe it was September of 2014 I know the USGS was down there for a while looking at that and I you're involved or engaged in remediating the acid mine drainage on there well as, as part of the overall project that's one okay. of the goals um, there's a, a geologist or hydrologist with the USGS Floyd Gray sure. and he's been very helpful and, and we've been working closely with him in trying to figure out how we could design a passive system mm -hmm. that mitigated the very low pH water, picked up the, the metal contaminants and we originally had proposed to the state of Arizona that we treat three drainages that were fairly significant and I think the total loading of, of metals coming out of that was in tens of pounds per month sure. and that flows down of course uh, into Lake Patagonia ultimately. Right. Um, what we've done is ended up remediating what's called the Lead Queen Mine. Yeah, I drainage. think that is right, Lead Queen Mine. Yeah. And that was interesting and in it's very similar on a modest scale to what happened in uh, the Animus River. Sure, mess. the Gold King Mine. The Gold King episode, Mine yeah. up in Colorado. Uh, at the Lead Queen mine, we had the two hurricanes kind of stop over southern Arizona, right, right. one after the other. And they filled up an old shaft mm -hmm. uh, with a very high level of water, and apparently that shaft was hydraulically connected to the Lead Queen mine okay. at it. And at some point, they had enough hydrostatic pressure mm -hmm. to almost like flush it out, like someone right. hit the, the down button on the john. Yeah. And it came out in a huge surge of orange water yeah, I remember roiling that. down the hill. And there sure. was a local, uh, I say kid because I grew up with him, but a uh, guy named uh, Goodwin, Gooch Goodwin, it was what I remember his name was as a kid. And he took these very nice pictures of sure. this orange flow headed down the down the downstream. Uh, very dramatic and I'm sitting in Pittsburgh I've just met with some companies on yeah. um, what do you do about mine water and in the Pittsburgh Gazette or Journal whatever it is there's a picture and down there it says by Patagonia I, said, I know that place so we got back in touch and right. with the, the, the federal people the state said look we think we have a sure. solution and it really uses a passive system. We put in a series of gabion dams, okay, uh, and they're designed to hold the zeolite behind, let right. the water flow through them, up over this reactive limestone in the gabion to, to help buffer any pH we don't get, then flow down, and uh, my recollection is the design also had zeolites on the other side, and then flow out. Mm -hmm. and the idea was to hold the contaminants in these zeolite beds, and I think about eight of I talked to, to Floyd on sure. Friday. Eight of the uh, 12 design dams are in place now. Oh, that's excellent. And so ultimately, you may be starting out with a very low pH coming out of that mine. Maybe it's a pH of two or two and a half or something. What are you, aim what are you targeting at the um, end of that? We've, we've done a lot of work on coal mine water. Sure. And there were similar pH levels. We're starting just under three and getting it in the mid to high fives, maybe okay. six. And that gets it just about to the point that aquatic uh, life can reestablish itself, okay. which is the goal. Yeah, Bugs at least, and, and, and right. things like that. Um, and that's a good start. And the benefit is that the zeolites don't end up with a lot of other stuff as a sludge and, and something else to dispose of. So we think long term that's, that's we, we want to continue to explore that as an option. Excellent. And we, it certainly turns out, or it seems to be, that we have, if not a growing problem with acid mine drainage in the western U.S., at least we're more aware of that problem. That's and correct. And that certainly the Gold King Mine brought that up in uh, August of this year. Yeah. And one of the problems is if you deal with lime treatment, there's a limit to how low you can get the contaminants. Sure. And the big problem is then it's an active even so, it's an active treatment system. You have to have a place yeah. for the sludge to settle, and you have to have 
something to do. So if you have right. a huge storm like we had, yeah, that's right. It doesn't all wash it out on downstream again. Yeah. And where are you getting your zeolites? That material is actually coming from our Winston deposit. Okay. That's a very large deposit of high purity uh, clinotellite. Okay. Uh, we do a lot of water filtration work with it, a lot of water treatment. We're testing sure. And that's the facility that we can provide some of the more economical sources. Uh, we have the buoy deposit, and that tends to be for. Um, and buoys out here in eastern Eastern Arizona, yeah, just about right. 15 miles from the Arizona New Mexico border and 12 uh -huh. miles north right. of Bowie. Um, that is the high end material. That's a natural zeolite that's very similar to a synthetic zeolite in both performance, but mm -hmm. not nearly the cost. And I brought a sample. Oh, for let's it. take a look at it. Now, this is primarily interesting because of the camel's footprint. <laughs> but this is the thickness of the bed. This is the top. Okay. The camel cast footprint was at the bottom. And as an aside, this is a moment in time that occurred yeah. about a million years ago. A family of camels or a group of camels was walking across this swampy uh, lake about a million years ago. Um, shortly after, in I don't know days, hours, minutes, but there was a volcanic eruption where the ash started to, to sure, fall right. from some distal place, probably central California, and deposited a, an initial layer of, of zeolite, really only about an eighth inch thick. And then mm -hmm. very quickly, the other six inches of zeolite accumulated, and then finally, over a long period of time, another four feet of what we call our upper beds okay. accumulated over the top of that. Um, the other interesting thing of this is you it's a diorama and that the family was walking and then from the south and west camels were being stalked by a saber-toothed tiger at some point they became aware of it and the tracks get very slippery wow. and uh, panicky and looking. you see the saber-toothed tiger tracks in the, that yeah the, the 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 bureau of land management i think came and covered all those but 30 years ago i i did save one small very good. For us. Thanks for bringing this in, and thanks for talking to us about zeolites. Is there anything that we didn't cover that you'd like to that you would like to chat about? Sure. One of the other interesting things that we're working on is a, a large uh, remediation project in New Mexico. Uh, the old Homestake uranium mill. Okay. Uh, the tailings pile for that leaked, contaminated groundwater, uh, and the state of New Mexico, EPA, uh, the new owner of the claims, because sure. they bought Homestake Barrack, is out there trying to clean this up and, and doing a good job. And we've, uh, working with a company called RIMCON, mm -hmm. uh, developed a, they developed, and we supplied the zeolites, sure. um, for a treatment process that allows us to treat groundwater pumped from a, wow. the contaminated aquifer up and over and uh, the, the uranium is taken out and taken okay. down to the EPA and state of New Mexico levels are very low and then it's re-injected back into the ground. Uranium and other radiogenic daughters or is it basically just uranium? I think they're just, out? on that one I think it's primarily okay. uranium and there's a process that goes. The zeolite doesn't necessarily naturally get uranium. Okay. But we're making a family of zeolite minerals to be specific for uranium, oh, to be specific for strontium, right. and that's ongoing R&D work that we yeah, have. Excellent. Thanks for coming on, and we'll have to follow up because this is very exciting stuff. Oh, well, thank you. Okay. Well, welcome to the Plumosa Mountains. Today we're on the Arizona Geological Society field trip and we've got John Spencer leading the trip as well as Phil Peartree, he'll be leading the trip tomorrow. We're currently looking at some of the extensional features, there's a major detachment fault in the area. John's going to help us understand some of the history and significance of these faults. John, what can you tell us? Well, the major structure in the range is the low angle plumosa detachment fault and it uh, has a foot wall of crystalline rocks. It basically represents a crustal section about the top 10 kilometers of the crust. It's been tilted over on its side and is now laid out below the Plumosa Detachment Fault. Above the fault are a whole bunch of tilt blocks that have been displaced northeastward above the Plumosa Detachment Fault. And each tilt block has a stratigraphy of tertiary sedimentary and volcanic rocks. 
and uh, the lower parts of the sections match from tilt block to tilt block, but the upper parts are different. So you can see how the basins were broken apart into separate basins during the time of tilting and extension. Simple enough, not. So during the evolution of these faults and, and associated uh, structural units, have we had some interesting fluids flow through these rocks? Right, well during the basin genesis, the um, the basins have a lot of uh, disseminated manganese oxides and uh, they're barite veins. Uh, one of the barite veins actually cuts the detachment fault, so at least at that one location, the barite mineralization is younger than the movement on the fault. But in general, the mineralization is restricted to the hanging wall rocks above the detachment fault and uh, locally includes uh, copper and gold deposits. Uh, some of which, especially the gold deposits, may very well be older than this Miocene period of extensional faulting and are associated with probably mafic dikes in the, in the older crystalline rocks. How significant has some of this mineralization been? You mentioned the manganese. Well, the, this is the largest manganese province in the United States. It's basically the La Paz County, a little bit bigger. It includes the artillery district in, in uh, uh, actually Mojave County. and. Um, the, the, uh, the manganese is all too low grade to be of economic uh, value today under current prices, but uh, if we ever got in a real bind nationally and needed manganese, there's at least some low grade uh, reserves here. Um, so that's the most significant regionally. The, the copper and gold deposits are certainly associated with detachment faults in other ranges around here, especially at Copperstone where there's been about a half a million ounces of gold production from a a deposit that's associated with a detachment fault, like the detachment fault in the Plumosa Mountains. I would think if anybody was looking for another uh, copperstone type deposit, this would probably be the place to look. They're difficult to find, but it's a good, good prospecting ground. So, any significance to the copper occurrences? Well, the, none of them are very big. Um, the, the ones that were mined historically in the buckskins were, were uh, small and high grade. Uh, but they're mined out, and um, it doesn't seem very likely that there's much future in copper mining uh, in these types of deposits when we've got these porphyry copper deposits that are so large in, in, uh, in Arizona in the southwest. First one of the minor commodities, uh, how about the iron that tends to be concentrated near the manganese occurrences? Well, they're, they're very uh, high-grade iron ore. They're just, again, they're, they're, small, uh, they're small deposits. Uh, one interesting use is that the specular hematite, which is iron oxide, uh, some of it is, is flaky. It, it forms sort of mineralogic sheets like mica, and they call it micaceous specular hematite, and it's been uh, at least proposed to be marketed as a paint additive because the flakes line up when the paint dries and provide a protective, uh, increased resistance in the paint. And uh, the advantage over is that it's non-toxic. The specular hematite is just iron oxide and it's very non-toxic. So it makes a good primer, also make a, a good attractive uh, reflective coating perhaps. Yeah. Another, another name for that is uh, micaceous iron oxide. Uh -huh. It's been mined and processed in the recent past. Well, John, thanks a lot for all those comments. Where are we off to next? Uh, well, the next thing we're going to see, there's another type of mineral deposit out here in western Arizona called the luminous metasomatic rocks. And they are basically Jurassic hydrothermal alteration systems that then were metamorphosed following thrust burial within the Maria Fold and Thrust Belt. And this has resulted in the generation of a lot of weird mineral assemblages in these rocks that had been clays but then were metamorphosed. Uh, it includes uh, oddball minerals like topaz, uh, something called svanbergite. Uh, a lot of it is kaolinite, um, quartz kyanite, perophyllite, rutile. Dumortierite, lazulite, uh, those are kind of a... Quite a collection of aluminum rich minerals. Right, and uh, some at some point the kyanite was being used for spark plug insulators. And uh, I heard one geologist describe it as uh, the champion spark plug mine, which he always thought uh, kind of provoked interesting mental imagery. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the kyanite was used for, for insulators. It's not being used anymore, but um, the historic uses of those deposits have been um, diverse, and uh, but they do have some gold associated with them, and that's that's been part of their interest. That may draw some folks back to them. Oh, should we go take a look? Yeah, it sounds good to me. Okay. Off we go.
So John, we've seen some interesting uh, rocks this afternoon. Conglomerates, landslide breaches, limestones. What are we looking at here? What, how can well, you put these, this are, these are some really uh, oddball mineral assemblages. These are Jurassic uh, hydrothermally altered, altered volcanic rocks that have mineral assemblages that reflect the mobilization and depletion of mobile elements. So things like calcium, potassium, sodium have been leached from the rock and things that are left behind include aluminum, uh, phosphorus, uh, titanium, uh, relatively immobile elements. And then those alteration assemblages have been metamorphosed uh, due to thrust burial and producing new mineral assemblages and some really oddball minerals like Svanbergite and topaz. All right. 